there's an old adage that goes something like this. If you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. Alright, first things first. Well, Buccaneer is a bit pirate-themed, because why not? I'm not going to be talking like a pirate the whole time. That would be very distracting and it hurts me throat. Second, Caravel is nowhere near ready to be built. At present, it's a series of spreadsheets, several years of research and launch vehicle development, and a twinkle in my eye. When Caravel flies in a decade or more, Emphasis on more, it might not even look like this. And third, yes, I got the name from the rocket and eyes turned skyward. I could think of anything else that worked. Big Dumb Booster? That's a good name, but that's a little on the nose. Liberty? Ah, no. Corman? Inspiring, but no way. Caravel. Also, it was one of the early ship designs that was used to you are using the transatlantic trade, so you know, there's some historical stuff there. If you're wondering how this came to be, there's nothing too exciting. I've always been a space nerd and wanted to build rockets. The first ever popular science magazine I read way back in fifth grade had T-Space's CXV and the Quick Reach 2 launch vehicle on it. Who knew where that would lead? One thing led to another, and I ended up graduating college with a degree in aerospace engineering and a vision to join private space. You can see how all that worked. While suffering through the job hunt process, I rediscovered Bob Truax's Project Private Enterprise. And that's when it clicked. The only way I was gonna satisfy my space dreams was to build a rocket myself in my garage. How hard could it be? All I needed was a garage and to lose my fear of heights. And at some point I realized that launching myself into space wasn't gonna be satisfying enough. I just have to build my own low-cost launcher. And that leads to now, with Caravel and Buccaneer boosters. Okay, so we're gonna skip over the basics of low-cost launch vehicle design, except for, you know, the few details here. Caravel is, shockingly, a big dumb booster, which minimizes parts in the engines and focuses more on low-cost components against higher performance systems that are generally more expensive. I'm not the turbo machinery guy, remember? The airframe will be a composite, most likely T700S, and all metal vehicle sounds really nice until you realize it drops your payload capacity to a third of what you're looking for, and it costs quite a lot. My sizing scheme comes from eight previous design studies. Yes, Caravel is yet another small set launcher. The problem is that if I build a medium lifter, I'll end up wallowing in development issues. If I go too small, I'll never make money and lose customers to more established providers, as well as rideshare. Caravel is sized to a gross liftoff weight of 55 metric tons with a payload target between 750 and 1200 kilograms. Let's take a look at a few possible Caravel configurations. Now I've sized them all to be the 55 metric tons and using liquid oxygen Jet A propellant with the goal of an eight foot diameter payload fairing and my cost assumption is based on a flight rate of four launches per year. Now I'm assuming Buccaneer's yearly expenditures are virtually identical in each case, which might be debatable. So let's start with the classic two-stage launcher. There's a few two-stage BDBs. Now this one can only carry 638.7 kilograms to LEO at a nice cost of $7,400 per kilogram. That's without putting profit in, mind you. Big pressure feds aren't exactly two-stage material without a more energetic upper stage. Okay, so let's take a look at the modular design. Four boosters and an oversized third stage. Modularity means I can get a wide range of payloads and can support various missions because of this. This basic design is about 1,028 kilograms and it costs a bit less. Not good, especially since a modular vehicle requires disconnects and other support equipment for the different configurations. 
So then we get to the classic, your basic three-stage launcher that harkens back to the good old days of TRW's LCLVs and Beale Aerospace. Nothing much else to say aside from the 1116 kilograms payload capacity. Well, there it is. Wait. This isn't the one in the thumbnail. Here's the thing. Caravel isn't that interesting at this point. Now, obviously I'm nominally against flashy rocket designs over more practical solutions. But what about reusability? That's the big thing these days. Your classic launch vehicle takes a ballistic trajectory to orbit. It's the most energy efficient method, unless you're going for reuse. Booster flyback is the big thing, but that's a massive controls problem, and it takes a noticeable performance hit. Downrange landing means you need to buy a boat or a barge and send it way out into the ocean. And neither of these methods are simple. What if a launcher was designed with easy first stage reusability in mind? Let me introduce you to the pop-up trajectory. If you've read The Rocket Company, you know exactly where I'm going. Instead of a ballistic trajectory, your first stage goes straight up, placing the upper stages onto a suborbital trajectory that takes it out of the atmosphere. Stages two and three then pretty much burn sideways into orbit. Simple, right? We'll start with the downsides. The downsides to this trajectory are that the second stage has to have a very high thrust to rate ratio or the payloads will fall back into the atmosphere. Upgrading the rocket with boosters doesn't really work unless you build specialized upper stages and the performance beyond low Earth orbit isn't ideal. You're also talking about a 19% performance hit against a classic ballistic trajectory, but reusability requires a performance hit anyway. But on the upside, reusability is built in. Your first stage effectively comes straight back down to the launch site. No flyback nor downrange recovery. There's also some simplification of avionics and your optimization. And here's the thing. This means you can launch this rocket anywhere. Now, there's a few private firms talking about their optimized launch pad that can go anywhere, but those rockets still need to have downrange clearance to fly. Pop-up does not need that. Okay, so then here's the question. How much better is reusability than your classic design? At four flights per year, they're about the same cost. However, at about seven flights per year, reusability becomes a clear victor. Now, of course, this depends on how much refurbishment of the first stage costs and how much it needs. Obviously, this is subject to change. And don't forget, pressure feds are a lot simpler than pump fed systems, which makes reusability a lot easier. With the pop-up trajectory set as the likely baseline, what propellants should Caravel use? I looked at three classics, ethanol, propane, and Jet A. Ethanol is the worst of all three, capable of only carrying 794 kilograms payload to low Earth orbit. The only benefit is that ethanol is easily available and is good for regeneratively cooled engines. Propane performs the best at 946 kilograms to LEO, but is hampered by its lower density and lack of flight history. Considering my future plans, this might actually be the actual fuel for Caravel. And we have Jet A, carrying 905 kilograms to LEO. It's the current fuel for Caravel due to its density and flight history. This means shorter development times. Now, I know the complaints, but what about coking and soot? Coking will happen if you design the engine wrong. Soot is inevitable for engines under 1000 PSI. Now that we've done a few basic trades, what does this rocket even look like? Caravel is a three-stage launcher, eight feet in diameter, and running on seven pressure-fed LOX Jet A engines. Stage one is powered by four Vernier engines and one main. It contains 34,890 kilograms of propellant and weighs 4.3 metric tons dry. Both the Verniers and main engine run at 250 PSI. The main engine, named Blackbeard, has 149.1 thousand pounds of thrust with roughly 250 seconds ISP. To satisfy issues with the pop-up trajectory, it shuts down after burning 95% total propellant. The Verniers, named after Charles Vane, have a thrust of 3,652 pounds each. They'll remain on during the entirety of the first stage burn to offer steering and stability during the final minute of ascent, as well as streaking the trajectory. Stage 2 Hot Stages It contains 10,462 kilograms of propellant and weighs about 871 dry. The unnamed engine operates at 100 PSI with 49,530 pounds thrust and 299 seconds specific impulse. 
This stage does a brunt of the work, getting the payloads on a useful suborbital trajectory up and out of the atmosphere. Stage 3 contains 3,662 kilograms of propellant and weighs about 245 kilograms dry. Its unnamed engine operates at 75 psi with 5,277 pounds thrust and a specific impulse of 317 seconds. In total, Caravelle has about a 905 kilograms payload to LEO. That's a decent payload capacity. So how does it compare to other launchers? Let's take a look. It's not too groundbreaking, but it is a lower price than vehicles of a similar size. I also want to make money on this thing. Caraval offers pretty much the same service that everybody else does, which is a good thing at just a lower price. But we do have the largest payload fairing of its class, which is also reusable, by the way, thanks to the pop-up trajectory. So it's nothing too groundbreaking at the moment. But hey, boring is better than flashy. So how do we get to this? We're not going to start by making a big old booster and hope everything works out. Buccaneer is going to start small with the BBR, Bargain Basement Rocket. This is where validation of construction techniques, modeling, methods, and other rocket company things will start. Better to figure out the basics of how Buccaneer does things as a company on something small than something very large. Here is where Caravelle's design and development will start to crystallize. Then we'll build BBR-50. This one has five vane engines, and will be used to do subscale demonstrations of first stage operations on Caravelle, like steering, start-stop transients on the main engine, the pop-up trajectory, and basic reusability. Payloads for these flights will probably be vanity projects or university payloads. It's very unlikely a commercial suborbital market will arise between now and the BBR, so I'm not counting on it. And then it's the full Caravelle, which will be developed through the standard methods and procedures probably conservatively. Customers do care about how fast you develop your rocket, but we're not going to sacrifice getting the rocket to the pad fast if it doesn't work. Working rockets get payloads. Rockets that don't work, don't. I have four test flights planned. First is the BFT, Booster Flight Test, which demonstrates the first and second stages, since those are the only unique aspects of this design, realistically speaking. On board will be a dummy payload. Assuming there are no serious issues, we'll go with the OFTs, which should demonstrate Caravelle's capabilities and iron out any issues that can't be caught on the ground. The goal is to be operational by OFT2, but we'll put in a margin for three. So where is Caravelle launching? Probably LC-48 at Kennedy, but Vandenberg or Wallops are in the suggestion pool. It depends on how much certain companies clog up the launch traffic there. Long term, I think Brazil's a good option. They've been begging for launchers, for the last 20 years, but there are others that can work. As for the satellite market, yes, Caravelle's a small sat launcher. Wow, exciting. But here's the thing, I know that. Who said I only had to build a launcher? You see, I have a vision of the future, a big, dumb future. Why not apply dumb launch to dumb spacecraft and not just Satellites? Satellite surfaces, kickstages, tugs, and whatever's coming next. Besides, small lift is limited. If Caravelle works as promised, and it will work, why stop there? Caravelle! That's a rocket you're gonna know.